you're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. We have two of our favorite guests back for a big debate this week. Last time they were together was one of our most watched shows ever. Brian Tyler Cohen is one of the most popular YouTube pages in progressive politics. On his podcast called No Lie, he interviews top names in democratic politics, including the White House Chief of Staff this week. Here's Brian's interview from earlier this year at the White House with the President of the United States, Joe Biden. Michael Knowles is a best-selling author and host of The Michael Knowles Show on The Daily Wire. His podcast, The Verdict with Ted Cruz, is one of the most popular in the conservative space. Brian, Michael, welcome back to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for well, having great us. Great to be with you. Uh, a big story this week, the various investigations of Donald Trump. In New York, he sat for hours of questions in a civil case, which is focused on the Trump Organization's finances. Apparently didn't say much during that deposition. He repeatedly pled the fifth, which of course is a constitutional right that allows you to avoid giving testimony that would potentially incriminate yourself. In the past, Trump would often mock those who pled the fifth. Here's a collection of those moments compiled by MSNBC. The Fifth Amendment. Fifth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Fifth Amendment. Horrible. You see, the mob takes the fifth. If you're innocent, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? Michael, what do you make of his decision to plead the fifth after mocking it for so many years? Well, uh, President Trump mocked that before he realized that the Justice Department and the FBI had uh, illegally uh, tr spied on his campaign, then tried to undermine his administration, and uh, now are continuing, I think, in an absolutely unprecedented, egregious sort of way to prevent him from running again in 2024 because he's the chief rival to Joe Biden. So I, I understand why he might mock his political rivals for taking the fifth, uh, in 2016, but once you find out that the FBI lied, fabricated uh, evidence on a FISA warrant, FISA application, such that the uh, FBI illegally spied on his campaign and then continued to go after him for years and years and years. I, I actually forgot to mention the $32 million years-long Mueller probe, also based on absolutely nothing, turned up nothing. At that point, I think you have to realize if you've got even two brain cells to rub together, gosh, these guys seem to be after me. The attorney general in New York, Letitia James, ran her campaign on destroying Trump, and it seems they're going to try to destroy him any way they can. Spaghetti at the wall. Go after the Trump organization. Go after his documents, use the Presidential Records Act or whatever. And so I think Trump was wise not to play ball with these people who are politically motivated and simply out to stop him from winning another term. Brian, is this much to do about nothing? You know, legal stuff aside, from the right, we're hearing every obfuscation in the book about how the DOJ and the FBI are politicized, how Biden personally signed off on all of this, how this is political retribution, a way to get Trump not to run. All of it is to distract from the fact that Trump is alleged to have broken the law you know, he, he withheld boxes of classified nuclear documents. He, uh, you know, all of everything that he was uh, accused of in the New York AG's probe. That's it. Republicans won't mention that part because they wouldn't be able to to wallow in perpetual victimhood. So instead, they'll deflect no, and cry foul and, and, and promote criminal, you know, conspiracy theories, anything but acknowledge the reasons for the search warrant, for example, in this in this most recent case at, at Mar-a-Lago. And then that's the guy that's because the guy is a criminal who can't stop breaking the law. But Ryan, have any other presidents violated the Presidential Records Act before? I can't speak to what other presidents have done with the. I, I well, know that this is I a big can. talking point. I, on, I know it's a big talking point on the right that, no, that President I'm Obama to... has stolen. Well, I know that this what, is, it's a big talking point on the right that President. What we don't know at this point is if if that was all that this was about because we don't know all the details Correct. of what led to the probable but Alex, cause. It's, it's worth pointing out because Brian brought up this point of Donald Trump violating the Presidential Records Act. For, J Donald Trump is accused of having some documents at Mar-a-Lago. Barack Obama took millions and millions of documents to Chicago, and he told the National Archives he was only doing that to digitize the documents, then he would send it right back. It's been five years they haven't digitized a single document. It's not just Obama. LBJ did it. Nixon did it. Took decades to get well, those documents back. So let, me, let me just the say, question, let me if the question comes to what kind, of, what kind of documents, could... too, and, and let, let's get into this for a moment. This week, the Attorney General, Merrick Garland, spoke about the FBI search of Trump's home in Mar-a-Lago. Here's some of what he said. Upholding the rule of law means applying the law evenly, without fear or favor. So we've already talked about it a little bit. The Wall Street Journal this week says that the FBI agent seized 11 boxes, including documents marked top secret. 
Critics say the former president did not follow the process to declassify those. The Washington Post says those documents include nuclear secrets for the U.S. Uh, Brian, you know, Michael is saying all this was overkill, was unnecessary, was politicized. What do you say? Well, first of all, let me just go back to what Michael had mentioned before about, about President Obama doing the same thing. That's a lie. Uh, the National Archives released a statement today that Obama has zero control over the maintenance of how those documents are stored and that they're unclassified. So all you have to do is look to what the National Archives just said to debunk exactly what he said. Barack um, Obama has that, no control over what the Barack Obama Presidential Library does with millions of documents? That seems a little strange those, to me. Those documents are stored by the National Archives, not by Barack Obama. He has no say over how those are maintained. They've already released this information. Alex, if, if you want later while well, you're the, editing the this to put that on the, the screen. Archives. Yeah. Well, well, but, nor were but, they for look, LBJ, nor are they for Richard Nixon. They're maintained by NARA. They're maintained by the National Archives, not by Barack Obama. Michael, are you, um, are you, con all, are you yeah, but Michael, are you concerned, though, to that point, though, that this concept of potentially having nuclear secrets just sort of floating around in your office, if that's what it really is? And again, we don't know yet if that's what this really is. Right. The same agencies that said that there was a, a tape of Donald Trump urinating on prostitutes in Moscow based on a dossier that we know was fabricated and paid for by Hillary Clinton, that's the same group that is now using anonymous sources insinuating through well, the Washington Post, which is the Pravda for the uh, deep state swamp propagandists, that these were nuclear secrets. But the point to classification, Brian brings up a great point here. The, the, the question is, were these documents classified? The president, Donald Trump, says they were not classified because Donald Trump, when he was president, had discretion to, to declassify whatever he wanted. And by the way, when we talk about the process for declassification, it's a very murky subject because the president does not answer to anybody on what can be classified and declassified. He doesn't answer to some middling bureaucrat in the DOJ. He is the president of the United States. So even if these documents were nuclear secrets or something, which I I seriously doubt that they are. We actually know from the warrant, which has already leaked, that a lot of them were binders of photographs and random sort of papers. That that still would not matter. President Trump could declassify as president whatever he wanted and, and post it on Twitter if the oligarchs in Silicon Valley had not kicked him off. It would seem to me quite clear that these uh, that President Trump had uh, every right to have certain of these documents with him. The DOJ was aware of that. And just to prove to you that this was not an urgent matter of national security, Joe Biden's been president for more than 18 months. If this was the, the urgent nuclear secrets that could destroy the world, why did they wait 18 months? Furthermore, the FBI got the warrant to raid Mar-a-Lago on August 5th. Why did they wait three days? They okay. said this is an urgent matter. All right, all right, all right. All right. Michael, you're, so you're, you're throwing every... I mean, I feel, like I'm, I feel, I feel like I'm living in a Fox News comment section right here. First of all, they I'm made that request to him. When, when, somebody, when somebody steals documents, normally they would just go get it. They gave him the benefit of the doubt. They made that request. Then they issued a subpoena, which is not something you would normally do for stolen and documents. He returned, then and a federal he returned magistrate. Lots of Hold the on, documents. Michael, Michael, let me I let you speak. Yeah, let, let me finish. just let me just get this out. They made that request, then they issued a subpoena, then they eventually had to get a federal magistrate to sign off on a search warrant when it met the evidentiary burden of probable cause. This idea mm. that they waited too many days, they issued that on a Friday. The search happened on a Monday. Also, this idea that Donald <laughs> Trump has sole authority to declassify any documents and so everything that he had in his possession was declassified anyway that doesn't matter because based on the crimes that he's alleged to have committed which are espionage uh, a, a violation of the espionage act obstruction of justice and criminal mishandling of government records it doesn't matter the classification doesn't matter um so you well, know, I only brought it up the Espionage you Act the means that Trump had so the Espionage that Act means yeah. means that Trump had information that could be used for the injury of the United States or to the advantage of a foreign of a foreign nation. I couldn't even begin to imagine the meltdown that you would be having if Barack Obama <laughs> took nuclear documents home with him or was being investigated for any of these things. I would well, charge you to look into your camera, Michael, and tell me that if you swapped out Donald Trump for Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton in the exact same scenario that you would be making all of these excuses. Well, it would be very difficult to swap out Hillary.
because mercifully she was never the president. But she did commit the exact same crime that Trump is being accused of. It was actually much more egregious when Hillary committed it because Donald Trump is accused of having had some documents which he had every right to declassify in a physical form that the DOJ knew about. They even told him to put a padlock on the room. Hillary Clinton had classified material on a server that was not secure that could have been and in fact was hacked by foreign governments. And furthermore, Donald Trump had documents that were years old, that were outdated documents. Hillary had the documents from her time as Secretary of State. So uh, these crimes were, were committed by the Democrats. The, uh, the difference is this. Hillary had much less of a right to do it, and there was no raid on the Clinton compound. All right, because, before we get, before before we get into a me, deep say, discussion of, of the, Alex, uh, let me just say really quick, thing. and you then know, we're going to move on. Republicans are losing their minds over Hillary Clinton's private email server, and it's been the better part of a decade now. That's how committed to the bit these guys over are over mishandled documents and national security secrets. And yet, this guy's got alleged nuclear secrets in his little golf course slash cemetery, and suddenly the pearl clutching over sensitive documents mysteriously vanishes. You know, if you think that Hillary Clinton uh, being careless with emails, and that's what uh, that that's the extent of what the federal government found is equivalent to Donald and, Trump and taking destroying, nuclear and destroying is equivalent evidence. is equivalent to Donald Trump taking nuclear documents to his golf course where he regularly consults with his very highly qualified buffet patrons um, and didn't return those documents even after a request and a subpoena then you are living on yes, another planet. All yes, right, let, 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 you're, you're just well, obviously not. Before we get into this hypothetical Hillary Clinton presidency, let's move on. Didn't. Let's move on and talk about the current president, Joe Biden. Uh, of course, he's dealing with the challenges of inflation, but he's also had a lot of legislative successes lately. Biggest climate change bill in U.S. history, biggest infrastructure bill, first major gun bill in 30 years, bipartisan investment in semiconductors, health care for burn pit survivors, unemployment low. He ordered the killing of the top leader of al-Qaeda. Still, his approval rating is only 40 percent, according to Real Clear Politics, which is an average of a bunch of polls recently, about 56 percent disapprove. Brian, do you think he deserves more credit, which I assume you do, and why do you think do. he's not getting it? Of course I think he, he, he deserves more credit. He's accomplished the most of any president in any of our lifetimes. Why he's not getting that credit is, is obvious. There's a right-wing media machine that's hell-bent on the destruction of his presidency. And let's not pretend that's the case here. You know, Biden could, Biden could cure cancer and you'd have Jim Jordan and the rest of the GOP complain that cancer has rights too. But I believe that the American people aren't stupid. They're recognizing not only what this administration is getting done, but what's at stake if Republicans do take control, and that is attacks on reproductive rights, restrictions on interstate travel and contraception, overturning uh, same-sex marriage, ignoring climate change, ignoring gun violence, and on and on. Michael, you think that well, the president deserves some more credit? Uh, I do not, but I do agree with one thing that Brian just said, which is that the American people are not stupid. They do know exactly what this administration is doing. That's why they overwhelmingly disapprove of it. A lot of those uh, legislative achievements that you pointed out there, Alex, uh, they c fall under a bill that the Democrats have called the Inflation Reduction Act that even the majority of Democrats don't think will reduce inflation. A study out of Penn Wharton's uh, budget model showed that it actually will exacerbate inflation. Even Bernie Sanders, who is one of the most left-wing senators out there, uh, Bernie Sanders refers to it as the so-called Inflation Reduction Act because it will not it will not reduce inflation, it will actually increase it. So you cite uh, low unemployment, uh, certainly after the government is, or the, the economy rather, is shut down by the government for two years, when you allow people to go back to work, that can have a nice looking effect on unemployment. But when you're talking about why people might disapprove of this administration, I think it probably has less to do with whatever those scary right wing talking points are and more to do with the 40 year record high inflation. And the, the president has, has got no plan to deal with inflation. So what does he do? He just redefines inflation. He redefines a recession. We are now officially in a recession. He just tries to change the dictionary definition of that. Well, they can manipulate language all they want. The left loves to do that. They can't change the underlying reality of what which the American people are well aware. Michael, like inflation are, is a real problem, isn't it, Brian? Of course inflation is a problem. It's a, it's a, it's a problem everywhere. There's 8% inflation in Canada. There's 8% inflation in Mexico, 8% inflation in the U.S., 9% inflation in Eight Europe, in the 9% inflation in the United Kingdom, 10% in Brazil, 10% in Netherlands, 10% in Spain. Argentina has 71%. Turkey has 80%. Did Biden cause all of that? Because, you know, 
we're hearing all of these mixed messages from the right. On one hand, Biden is this senile puppet who's not in control of anything, or he's this, you know, unilaterally responsible for every country in every country on the earth, their inflation. So it, it's getting kind of difficult to keep up with these. I don't think we've ever claimed. I don't claim that he's responsible for Argentina's inflation. But Brian, if your argument going into the midterms is that Joe Biden has done a better job handling the economy than the tin pot dictatorships of Latin America, that seems like a pretty low bar. I don't think the people are going to reward Democrats. Democrats for that. Well, let's talk a little no, bit. I, I, let me let me say one more. Let me say one more thing. There hasn't been a single Republican administration in any of our lifetimes that's actually added more jobs or performs better than a Democratic administration. <laughs> in fact, most of the Republican administrations are, are are plunging us deep into recessions, and then the Democratic presidents have to get us out of those recessions. And if you can point to a single example in the last three decades of that not being the case, I'd love to hear it. Well, let, let's Brian, try. Biden sent us into a recession right now. <laughs> we officially entered into a recession last week. And when you, you keep citing the unemployment numbers, the government forced the economy to shut down for two years. So yes, of course, when you tell people they're allowed to go back to work, they will go back to work. That's not the sign of economic health. You see this reflected in the consumer price index and the producer price index. You, you see this reflected all over the economy. All right, let, let's talk for a moment about the midterms, right? Because we're about to have this big choice as a country. And if Republicans win back the House, it'll likely be another Californian, Kevin McCarthy of Bakersfield, running the show. What would that mean for the average person watching right now? Uh, Michael, the real world difference of Speaker Pelosi versus Speaker McCarthy. Well, the, what you would get if the Republicans only win the House is you would be able to stop these ridiculous spending bills that will mortgage away more of our future and actually exacerbate inflation. So I suppose that would be a good thing. But that's really all it would do. If the Republicans also manage to take the Senate, which may or may not happen, it's a tough electoral map this year for the Republicans, that would go a little bit further. It would be able to stop some of Joe Biden's horrible appointments, the kind of people who are turning our even our law and federal law enforcement agencies into tools for uh, partisanship. We were discussing a little bit earlier the tin pot dictatorships of Latin America. This is, of course, the first time that you've ever seen federal law enforcement raid the home of a former president and presumptive GOP nominee, the political rival of the incumbent. So that, that, that would be something that Republican senators could stop. But beyond that, we've just but, got but to get Michael, rid of to that point, Biden. though, the, 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 the head of the FBI, also the first time the head of the FBI wise. was appointed by Donald Trump, who's a Republican who worked at Republican administrations <laughs> and, Alex, and was widely supported Alex, by the, Republicans. The Joe Biden's attorney general, Merrick Garland, who was almost a, a Democrat nominee for the Supreme Court, or almost a Democrat justice, rather, he was the one who made the call. There was some confusion initially. Who made the call to raid Mar-a-Lago? Was it the FBI? Was it the White House? Was it the DOJ? But it was, it was Joe Biden's AG who did it. So I know Democrats keep bringing up this point that Trump appointed Christopher Wray. And uh, first of all, Donald Trump made some suspect appointments throughout his presidency. I'm not going to defend all of his appointments. I thought he only appoints the best people. <laughs> Unfortunately, there were a few errors on personnel there, but you can't blame the raid even on Christopher Ray. That goes up to Merrick Garland. Uh, Brian, uh, your, your thoughts on what a Speaker Kevin McCarthy means for the country? Well, we don't really have to guess what a Speaker Kevin McCarthy means for the country because he's already promised that if the Republican Party takes over, they'll use their majorities to obstruct investigations into crimes by Republican politicians. You know, it'll be two years of Jim Jordan speaking 400 words a minute about Hunter Biden. Like the entire federal government apparatus will basically devolve into a comment section of a Dan Bongino Facebook video. So I, I would just say directly to people watching, you have a choice. Either your tax dollars go toward allowing the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the party to set the investigative calendar and our government is going to be guided by Q drops and probes into bamboo fibers in, in, in ballots or your tax dollars can go to a party that is protecting reproductive rights, which the majority of Americans support, protecting same-sex marriage, which the majority of Americans support, combating climate change and making the U.S. a leader in clean energy, which the majority of Americans support, and creating a just tax system where the rich actually pay their fair share, again, which the majority of Americans support. So that choice is yours. Uh, all right. Brian, I just have one question on that. Just one question, which is you mentioned that if the Republicans take the Congress, that they'll investigate Hunter Biden. Why would they investigate Hunter Biden? 
because like I said, all they do is spout off about the same thing to find people to vilify. If it's not Hillary Clinton, if it's not George Soros, if it's not Hunter Biden, it's mm -hmm. always somebody to vilify, to distract from I thought it was crimes. the videos of all of the crimes that he committed that are not being investigated right now because we have a two-tier justice. I don't, justice I don't seem to remember Hunter Biden be elect, being elected to any position. I'm focused on the on what our government can actually do to help people. No, he, you guys he just traded his father's info for the All right, before no, we develop no no into a Hunter Biden d discussion, let's talk about an issue that I think <laughs> Probably more people in the country are are more focused on, which is abortion rights. Uh, the VP weighing in this week. The government should not be in the position, nor should it have a right, to make the most intimate and personal decisions that anyone can make about heart and home. Vice President Kamala Harris gathering various California leaders in San Francisco this week to discuss the state's response to abortion rights. We're talking with Brian Tyler Cohen on the left, Michael Knowles on the right. Uh, Michael, when the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas wrote about the court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and return the abortion decision to the states, he suggested they should do the same thing for gay marriage. No other justice joined him in that decision. Michael, I know uh, your podcasting partner, Ted Cruz, thinks that Justice Thomas has it right on the gay marriage issue. Do you agree with him? He certainly does, although uh, we should clarify here, Thomas's point was on a matter of constitutional interpretation. So he was not expressing his views of marriage or, for that matter, uh, matter contraception within marriage in the Griswold decision or contraception outside of marriage in the Eisenstadt decision. He was expressing his view of, of a, a concept called substantive due process, which really took off uh, because of liberal uh, legal activists in the latter part of the 20th century. Substantive due process, which is a contradiction in terms. A process, of course, is a procedure, substantive due process, suggesting that you have have uh, certain rights that are procedural rights outside of a procedure. It was just a way for the court to cram in a whole bunch of things into the Constitution that aren't really there. I, I beg you to find me the right to a condom or the, the necessity of redefining marriage away from what everyone for all of history had ever thought it was in the Constitution. It simply is not there. So Thomas is absolutely right that substantive due process is a bunch of nonsense and, and we should get rid of it as a matter of the rule of law. But, but it's worth pointing out just as a political matter. Justice Thomas was the only justice on the court to sign on to that concurrent opinion. Uh, the, the rest of the conservatives would not even sign on to that. Sam Alito, the much maligned Sam Alito, the far right justice, he, he would not sign on to that either. So as a practical matter, Obergefell, Griswold, Eisenstadt, Lawrence v. Texas, they're just, they're, they're not at risk right now, even from the most conservative members other than, say, Clarence Thomas. Before we get too much uh, into the weeds of a law school seminar, which is what we just <laughs> let, let me, if I, could just, if I could just say one thing, yeah. one thing to that, and not on the legalese of it, but, you know, it's, it's, it is always funny how the same people who warned that Roe was not in danger are now warning that same-sex marriage is not in danger, contraception is not in danger, interstate travel are not in danger. If we listen to these people, uh, if we listen to these people when they had promised us that Roe wasn't in danger, we wouldn't be in a country right now that's just had 50 years of precedent and a woman's right to her own bodily autonomy stripped away. Well, I, I'll, I'll say just for my own part, I have never suggested Roe is not in danger. I have always been very uh, hopeful that Roe would be overruled because uh, you, you're discussing bodily autonomy. I'm all for the bodily rights of babies in the womb. And, uh, and after the Dobbs decision, of course, that d didn't even protect the, the rights of babies in the womb, it simply returned the issue to the, to the states where it had always been until this ridiculous decision in 1973, which is no more. All right. I mean, we're looking at, we're looking at, you know, ahead, more than 50 years of precedent. And you mentioned some of these cases, Griswold in 65, Eisenstadt in 72, Roe in 73, and Casey in 1992. All of that is precedent upon precedent. And, you know, claiming that the court is only correct now that, it, that, it's, uh, that it's following your specific uh, political and, and or religious views show that, shows that you're just interested in cherry-picking decisions that comport with those views. Um, you had Brian, also are you mentioned familiar with the Dred Scott decision? Yes. The Dred Scott decision, uh, which said that black people can never be American citizens, that was also Supreme Court precedent, right? Would you say that the court was right Here's to the overturn the Dred Here's Scott the decision? Difference. This is the first time, first time that the court has reversed its, a decision to take away rights, and it has stripped that right from half of the population. And the practical impact of that is that, you know, in, in real life now, we're looking at a 10-year-old in Ohio who would have been forced to give birth to her rapist baby. We're looking at incest victims potentially giving birth to their own brothers or sisters. We're looking at doctors being jailed. We're looking at police questioning people about miscarriages. I mean, that is, that is a police state.
Michael, is that well, small you... government? Is that is that limited government? Because to me, it looks like that is limited. Yeah, it looks like Christo well, well, fascist religious referring... extremism. Christo the fascist case you're religious to... extremism. The case you're referring to in Ohio, Brian, by the way, the 10-year-old who was reportedly raped, she, she actually, by the Ohio law, would not have been prevented from uh, getting an abortion in Ohio, regardless of what you think about pro-life or pro-abortion. That she, she may have gone to Indiana, but she, she wouldn't have needed to. But, but furthermore, when you talk about right, uh, uh, rape and incest and all of that, that accounts for far less than 1% of all abortions. The, statistically, 100% of abortions are elective abortions. I think those should be gotten rid of. And I think the Dred Scott analogy is important here because the Dred Scott so, decision from the court said that black people are not really people and they can't be American citizens. And the Roe v. Wade decision from the court said that babies are not really people and their existence and their value depends simply on whether they're desired or not by their parents. And both of them are horrific, and it's very good that both were overturned. So if, if, no. if it's only just a small percentage rape and incest, that 1%, do you uh, agree with an exemption for rape and incest then? Well, it's it also kind of curious that people uh, make these two distinctions between rape and incest. I don't know of a whole lot of consensual incest, so it's, we're really just talking about exceptions for the case of rape, and the, the liberals always try to argue from the absolute most hard cases. But the, the argument for pro-life is that a person is a person, no matter how small, and also an abortion does not fix anything. Abortion will not get rid of a rape. Abortion will not undo any sort of crime. Abortion does not even make any lifelong... Uh, uh, take away any lifelong responsibilities or anything like that. There is such a thing as adoption. You can deal it with very difficult, horrible circumstances in a way that will not increase trauma to people, as abortion does, and will not lead them to commit horrific actions and, and to end a human life. We're running out of time, just, Brian. Last say, word to you. I would just say to that, I have two things to say to that. One, it doesn't matter what your opinion on this is because this is not your body, it's not your choice. You're not the one who is able to make this decision for anybody else, regardless of how easy you, Michael Knowles, think it is, thinks it is for somebody to put their uh, child up for adoption. The second thing I say, I would say it's, is- It's very easy. There's 36 couples for every one newborn who's put up for adoption. 36 couples who want to adopt in America. Here's the thing. Whether we're talking about abortion or, or, or gay marriage, you know, these these are people's lives that you're messing with right now, all because you think that your religious beliefs are licensed to dictate how other people live. And what's craziest for me is how you guys shove this idea of limited government down everybody's throats, and yet the people constantly stripping others of their rights are Republicans. If you don't want an abortion, don't get an abortion. If you don't want a gay marriage, don't get gay married. If you don't want to read certain books from libraries, don't read those books from li libraries. If you want to, don't want to identify differently, then don't. But why should nobody get these things? You know, with all if of these things. If you don't want to commit a murder, with don't all of commit these a murder. Things, hold on, Michael. Let me just finish my point. With all of these things, you lose nothing. All that happens is that other people enjoy equal rights, and yet conservatives' beliefs are apparently so goddamn fragile that the mere existence of people who are different from them is somehow a threat to you. I don't think any of those platitudes mean much of anything. We just don't want babies to be killed in the womb. You, you brought up this but these point, aren't, Michael, these aren't babies. And if you wanted to use the 1% they example, they are if babies. you wanted to use the 99% and 1% example, 99% of these abortions happen uh, in the first trimester, and also they're Still not babies. babies. They they are they are they embryos. Are. They are non-viable right. embryos. A, and of course, you know, that, Brian, do you know what the word fetus means? Of course, of course, of course, we're, we're, you know of course the, I don't know if we're there, gonna. There's one very important point to make, even beyond pointing out that the word fetus is just Latin for offspring. The important point to make in responding to what Brian said, Michael, there, depending, is on, you the, said depending that on the depending on the gestational depending on the gestational stage. These are not all fetuses. They're, they are, they're, they are all zygotes human beings and embryos, then fetuses. No, all right. I don't, I, 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 I don't think there's, there's, there's one embryo. Okay, we're not all going to talk over each other. Which is they become babies. All right. I there, don't, there's I, one important point that Brian made that I have to respond lastly, to. Lastly, okay. Brian, you said that be, because I'm a man, I do not have any right to have it's an opinion on abortion. It's because it's not your body. I would, That's I would, the point well, I was I would making. Notice I would notice, Brian, and I hate to assume your gender, that you are also a man and you are opining on abortion. And more importantly, the Supreme Court that decided Roe v. Wade, how many women were on that court that decided that issue? Of course, there it's were. It's not a matter of your zero. gender. It's a matter of it not being my body. It's a matter of it not being your body. That's the point. Okay, we're going to so end, we're gonna end it there because we got to end it okay. somewhere. Uh, <laughs> we, we've had a contentious debate between Michael Knowles on the right.
Brian Tyler Cohen on the left. Let's have some fun with them in our last remaining moments and see if we can find anything for them to agree on. So we play a game called Personal Issues. We're putting 30 seconds up on the clock. This is uh, first thing that comes to mind. Be quick with it. Okay, uh, uh, Michael, we'll start with you. What's your favorite band or musician? Elvis Presley. Brian. Pretty Lights. Brian, what's your favorite book of all time? Oh, you know what? I'm going to go for a recent one, uh, Jamie Raskin's most recent book. Michael? Dante's Divine Comedy. Outside of the Bible, Dante. Or Speechless by Michael Knowles. Uh, Michael, favorite movie? The Godfather, followed by Me, Myself, and Irene. Uh, Brian? Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Okay, and lastly, to each of you, Michael, dogs or cats? I'm a people person. <laughs> Brian? Oh, I'm a dog person, for sure. Uh, yeah, and, and Brian, the last time you were on, you, you talked about your love for your dog, Aston, right. who may get more attention than any dog on the planet. But, <laughs> but since you were on, uh, you, you kind of cheated on Aston a bit. Here is video of you and President Biden's dog when you interviewed the president at the White House. Maybe we can bring this up. Uh, what, was, what was that moment like uh, meeting the presidential dog? Yeah, look, dogs can do no wrong. It was, it was, uh, it was right up there with meeting President Biden himself. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big advocate for dogs. They, uh, they, they can do no wrong in my book. And Michael, don't spin this that uh, a dog is as good as Joe Biden, which I, I'm sure you're, you're working on. But uh, <laughs> since, <laughs> since we last talked, last time we did this, you had just had a baby, and now you've had another baby, which I think we've got a photo of you and your beautiful wife there. Uh, what's it like? How's fatherhood times two? How's it going? You getting any sleep? It's absolutely magnificent. I hope that when I watch the playback of this debate and discussion today, I'm speaking even somewhat coherent English because I have not slept in two weeks. But it's still wonderful. The little guy is extremely cute, and uh, I already want to make another one. I think my wife might want a little break, but me, I'm ready to go for number three. <laughs> All right. Well, we encourage you to check out both of their podcasts. Check out our podcast for more debates like this. The issue is just search for that wherever you're looking for a podcast. Brian, Michael, this was really fun. Thank you both for bringing it in a big way this week. Thank you. Great Thanks to be with you both.